Lisa. Welcome back to DXB Today, where tonight we are covering the biggest storm the UAE has seen in 75 years. And there's two words on everyone's mind, not cloud seeding, but climate change. So to talk to us about that, please welcome our next guest who is dedicated to climate change conservation. Please join us in welcoming Tanzeed Alam, Managing Director with Earth Matters Consulting. Thank you so much for being on the show. Pleasure, thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about what Earth Matters Consulting does. Great, thank you for the opportunity. We work on technology solutions to help drive impact on the ground to address the climate crisis and the nature crisis to help conserve our natural environment. So we've been doing that for seven years, working with government in the UAE, in Dubai, with businesses around the region, also with the European Union. And we're very passionate about making sure that solutions are practical and can actually drive a positive change in the topic. Mm. Uh, Tanzid, uh, let, let's talk about the storms because it felt a bit of a freak occurrence, right? It, it felt like it was completely alien to the UAE. Uh, but tell me how climate change is actually affecting these kind of storms and can we see more of them coming our way? Sure, well, we're already experiencing warming of almost one and a half degrees mm -hmm. from pre-industrial times in the 1900s. And that's pretty unprecedented territory for human beings on this planet. And that's an average warming. And what happens is if you imagine when you're boiling your kettle, the water bubbles over and there's spillage, the climate system reacts to the heat that's in the system and then becomes more chaotic. Mm. So we are going to see extreme events becoming more frequent and more intense. So the one in 75 year, year storm that we're talking about could happen one in every 20 years, 15 years, 10 years. So we have to be prepared for that future because that is unfolding before us. Mm -hmm. The UAE is not immune to that. It's happening kind of in other parts of the world. Um, I'm originally from Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. When I was eight years old in 1988, as so I'm giving away my age, <laughs> um, we were living in a first floor apartment where I remember we had unprecedented floods and I had to jump off the balcony with my dad onto a boat, to go to the market because we had such bad flooding and eventually we had to abandon our apartment to go and live with family elsewhere. That was in 1988 and Bangladesh is also a very vulnerable country to climate change. So I'm saying that because these incidents are happening and the most vulnerable are usually the ones who get the most affected as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're about to enter the summer climate change in the summer. Here, it gets hot enough as it is. What do you think, based on your data and your experience, will happen for the summer months? Sure, well, the big area actually to worry about is heat. You know, we're already in a hot part of the world. We, we years ago helped the government of Dubai to actually look at its climate change adaptation strategy. How do you address the worst risks? So heat was the biggest risk. Heat stress is chronic, it can affect infrastructure. You know, we already, you know, we're lucky we can get into homes that are air conditioned. We're pretty insulated from that. But when you get 50 degree days on consecutive days, four or five days a week or more, that's called a heat wave in this region. And that can really affect people. So making sure kind of the elderly, the young don't go out in that time. Your workers who are not working outdoors are well protected. They don't have, they shouldn't be working in those extreme heat conditions. Some of those safeguards are already in place here. But being able to deal with those sorts of heat related incidents are really important. And heat has chronic impacts as well, making sure your healthcare authorities are aware when there's a heat wave coming to be ready with their doctors, their nurses to be able to deal with more heat stress related injuries and issues that they might be facing. So there's a lot of kind of systemic that it causes the heat and the impact. Sticking, and with, sticking with Dubai specifically, yeah. with regards to, as you say, the heat and it's the climate change it's going to be changing a lot how do you think that's affecting dubai specifically in terms of urban planning and infrastructure alone we've already mentioned about the metro and how sometimes the metro isn't close to a car park or to the actual buildings people need to get to anything going to change there sure i mean firstly i mean dubai is an amazing city how quickly it's changed i've been here 16 years to see that change mm. and the forward thinking and the leadership here really makes it the city of the possible. We can deal with all challenges and we talked about the community spirit and so on. So climate change is very much a challenge and an opportunity for a country and like the UAE and a city like Dubai. What we need to see with urban planning and this was some of our recommendations to the government of Dubai at the time was make sure climate change forecasts, scenarios of sea level rise, heat 
heat rise, heat, you know, temperature increases, flooding, it's all embedded and baked into your urban plans. We've just had an, you know, you could say that's a baseline of what are the most vulnerable parts of this city from the flooding. We have satellite images, all of that is free. You don't need consultants to tell you that. You can access that and make sure those vulnerable areas are well protected. Deal with the surface water drainage systems and actually plan where you want to build your city based on climate change and how it will affect your city. So um, we, we say we have a lot of land here, we have a lot of deserts, but actually maybe some areas aren't suitable for development. And your insurance companies will want to know that so they can price that risk in. So you don't just say after an event, we're going to hike up our premiums twice so then poor old person on the street has to pay a lot more when it already costs a lot to live here. So we have to figure out those things and it all the system has to work together. All right, so uh, short term, you've got an audience with government officials here. Yeah. What advice would you pass along to them to say, this is what I think you should be doing, say over the next five or seven years? Sure, deal with your surface water drainage systems, make sure they're clean, look at that baseline from this flood, make sure it's well connected to your storm water drainage systems. If sewage is overflowing as well, get the municipality involved to make sure water is well tested and making sure people get fresh water so there's confidence in what water you're actually drinking. I know there were some issues around that mm. in Sharjah and other parts of the country. So it's connected. It's not just the role of an environment department to deal with this. It's a crisis and emergency management planning response that requires a whole of government response. Mm. And ultimately the private sector have to follow suit with that. You know, you, you explained it really well before. Some people were forced to go into work when they shouldn't have been. It's just unethical, I feel, <laughs> to force people to go into work. More the environmental side, I want to ask, because I've been seeing a rhetoric uh, yeah. across the UAE, across the world of, oh, after the rains, everything's so green. There's a lot of greenery in the desert now. We're seeing Fujairah, it's sprouting out. Now, I'm an Arab man, and I think there is beauty in the desert. And I think a lot of people think green is good, desert maybe not so good. Is that good for this part of the world to have that amount of greenery? Is it unnatural? Greenery is important, of course. You, you don't just have no life in the desert. My background's in conservation and I, go, I love going into the desert and seeing the wildlife there. Obviously not the snakes or the scorpions, mm -hmm. but, um, but the greenery is important. But it, it is unnatural to think we can re-green the desert to make it like a tropical rainforest, which I'm not saying some people are proposing, but just be aware the environment can't sustain that from a water perspective. You could have unprecedented levels of rain, like we had almost two years of rain in one day, but we can't deal with that water. The desert doesn't just absorb the water as we've seen, <laughs> just because it's sand, it actually drains off and floods other parts. So it's about how you manage that water system and make sure we're efficient. We rely on desalination here, which is a real privilege that we have that technology, but we can't just be wasteful with how we use that water either. Mm. Um, Recycling our water is important and then using that in our green spaces to have more spongy cities is important to deal with the flooding. So having parks that can actually absorb that water, having drainage and tank systems underneath below ground that can take up more of that overflow is important as well. So um, that can all happen and you can have really nice green spaces that people can enjoy, but that can also protect you from climate change. Mm. Yeah. Tanzid, I want to thank you so much Thanks. for joining us. Super insightful, so we hope to have you back again very soon. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, but for now, over to Katie for DXB in 60. <laughs> That's right, it is that time. Michael, did you know we were going to quiz you today? I did not. Well, here we go. <laughs> right, it's the DXB in 60. Don't worry, the question's all about you, so you should know the answers. We're going to have 60 seconds up on the screen, and we'll start that in three two, one, let's go. If you weren't working in journalism, Michael, what would you be doing? Uh, professional ice hockey player. Nice, <laughs> hashtag Canada. What was your first job? I worked as a bus boy in 1979, giving away my age, <laughs> uh, at an Indian restaurant in Toronto. Amazing. If you had a superpower, what would it be? Reading minds, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, then I wouldn't have been here knowing this is going to happen. <laughs> Did you just read his mind? <laughs> um, do you have a motto in life and in work? If so, what is it? Be kind. Oh, that's nice. Uh, what is your go-to restaurant in Dubai? <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> there is pressure. I can feel it. <laughs> I don't know that I have one. And the reason I say that is because I am on more than day 2000 of MyFitnessPal, which means I weigh all my food. 
Wow. And I am fanatical. If I am OCD about anything, mm. it's about this. So I <laughs> don't go out that much. Well, it's working. <laughs> well, yeah, clearly. It looks amazing. Very quickly, because time is up, but it's a question we love to ask. Why Dubai? We came in 2003, and we love it. I can tell you why we stayed. We stayed because of the weather. We stayed because of the people, because of the culture, because of the experience, because of the opportunity to travel. I don't know why we came in the first place. You know but we're what? glad but we're glad that you stayed. Thank you. DXB in 60 with Michael. Thank you so much, Michael. Appreciate actually, it. Actually, my favourite answer to that question. I don't yeah. know. It was actually really nice. Yeah. Michael, thank you so much for being our guest thank you today. It was great having you. We hope to see you again. I appreciate it. And Tenzid, of course, thank you so much for being here with us as well. Thank you. Pleasure. Right. But for right now, don't go anywhere because we do have our performance coming up with Chelsea Chantel. That's on the way next. You don't want to miss this.